We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net. The views expressed by the individuals during this broadcast are their own opinions, and they may not be the same as those of their group or other organizations they may be involved with. Hello everyone and welcome to the Pace Radio Show. It's November the 10th, 2021 and we are live and we are coming to you from paceradio.net. I'm your host, Al Graham, and tonight my joint host, Kim Cooper, and I, we have a guest here who has been a Canadian, within the Canadian cannabis community for years, uh, first through owning a cannabis accessory store and is now speaking up to millions of Canadians who want uh, to help, you know, normalize cannabis here in Canada and around the world, matter of fact. Uh, but before we get into that, Kim and I are going to have our usual chat, a little bit of a news item going on. So what's new and exciting, Kim? Uh, new and exciting, I live in the far north of Ontario. We should be under a couple of feet of snow by now. We should be at, you know, minus 10 temperatures. And we've got fall happening out there still. I've got green grass that what? I'm looking at. And we're still getting up to 6 and 10 degrees during the day. You still cut? You, are you I have st- no idea. Cut, have you still got the lawnmower out? No, I, I I packed it away, but it could use to be out. It could use another cut before the snow comes, <laughs> but it's already put away, so it's staying put away, and I'm not doing that. But yeah, we haven't seen weather mm. like this up here here in a couple of decades. Yeah, I know. You, you usually got snow by now. Like you get you get, you get snow. Yeah, you get snow in, and- in early October. Yeah, we always have snow usually by Thanksgiving, um, yeah. and, you know, the temperatures are, are relative to that. And, you know, plus 6, plus 10, this is wild, but I'll take it all day. <laughs> 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 yes, I agree. I can agree with that for sure. All right, on to uh, something in, in the news, which uh, I grabbed here tonight, and I... I um, this is something that I've I keep an eye on because our community here, our count, our not our community, but our council, our community was seventy four percent in favor of cannabis retail stores, but our council voted against the stores, and part of the problem was impaired driving. This was, you know, that was their concern. Yeah. And uh, here in a Prince George report, um, they say in the headline here that there's no increase in traffic injuries of, uh, following cannabis legalization, according to uh, this what this feature is found. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool. I mean, and we predicted this uh, pre-legalization, you know, and those of us that are in the cannabis community knew this is how it was going to play out. Uh, But, you know, the powers that be had to have the proof. Well, the proof is in the pudding, so they say. And a study by a northern medical program professor found that the legalization of cannabis in 2018 has not resulted in an increase in traffic injuries. Uh, They got data from Alberta and Ontario emergency departments from April 2015 to December 2019 and found in the years immediately following legalization, there's absolutely no evidence of significant changes in traffic injury visits to hospital. Well, they, yeah, he even says that he he was surprised that that that, that was the way that things turned out because he was himself expecting to see numbers go up, and uh, they didn't. And that yeah, even yeah. that even includes yeah, in the younger categories. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, you know, the big the big uh, push in the beginning of legalization and pre legalization is was of course, what about the children? Uh, you know, we heard that for a long time. That narrative was pushed big time. Oh, think of the children. Um, well, you know what? The numbers are are here, and uh, we did think of the children. They didn't think that the children were smart enough to differentiate things, and apparently. Uh, uh, 
we prevailed in this particular wow. debate as as we're finding out now from the stats you know yeah. uh, youth defined as individuals between 14 and 17 in Alberta and 16 and 18 years old in in Ontario found no increase in traffic related injuries in those categories either yeah yeah they yeah say it wasn't just they this they didn't just focus on the injuries of the drivers they focused on the injuries of, the, yeah. of those age groups of the, of the youth, even though they weren't consuming, but they would still be in a vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, what about the children? The children are fine. Um, <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, they, um, yeah, they, they did this. This project included um, people from uh, the UNBC, uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, CAMH. Uh, University of Victoria was involved in it, Dalhousie, Dalhousie University. Uh, was involved in this study as well. So, you know, this is, wasn't just something that somebody just pulled some numbers out of newspaper reports. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I love that it was his ongoing research is in the field uh, into potential harms and benefits of cannabis legalization. Um, you know, they were absolutely going after the harms. Uh, his yeah. shock by the numbers tells us that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and now he's including benefits within there because we don't see that yes. all the time. Yes. No, so. no, we don't. So we're, we're adding in benefits because uh, they're not finding any harms. So we yeah. might as well look at the benefits. And and I think that's fantastic. And it's it's more um it's more proof. It's more uh I'm looking for a word and I'm lost at the moment. I need another dab to find my words. Um but <laughs> You know, it's it's confirmation Listen, of what yeah. we have been saying for many years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, we've we've seen things over, since cannabis legalization over three years, where they've reported, you know, quotes from the police themselves saying that, you know, it wasn't what they expected. Things have yeah. been really, really yeah. good. It's not so. what any of them expected. Yeah. This yeah. Guy did, yeah. yeah. And, and but we did. You know, us in the cannabis community knew because you know we're. We're already part of society. We are cannabis community members. We're cannabis consumers for decades, most of us. Um, we've been living normal lives, and everybody we know around us lives normal lives. And there is no increase in traffic accidents pre-legalization, and, and the consumption levels uh, were being had then. They were just being done in secret. So I'm not surprised by this, and I'm thrilled that... Uh, we finally got some confirmation on what we've been yelling and screaming about all this time. That's right. Yes, exactly. That's, that's right. Yep. Yeah. All right. What do you say? Yeah. Time to bring in our guest? Absolutely. I'm excited for tonight's guest. A uh, little flash from the past uh, connection to an organization that I was involved with many moons ago and got me started on the path that I'm on now. So I'm always uh, geared up to talk to somebody from there. All right. Well, at this time, we'd like to welcome our guest, who I said was trying to normalize cannabis here in Canada and elsewhere. We'd like to welcome Jenna Way McLean, the Executive Director of Normal Canada and owner of Calix and Tricones Cannabis, to the Pace Radio Show. Good day, Jenna Way. How you doing? Hello. Hi, everybody. About both of you. Hello, everybody out there, too, in Radio World. Good to uh, see you. Good to talk to you all. <laughs> It's uh, it's good to talk to you, and we re really appreciate you coming in on here on the program to talk to uh, our listeners and as well as to ourselves and uh, get us up to date on things. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Kim? Yeah, excellent. I, I, I'm uh, looking forward to diving in tonight to many different subjects, uh, both on a personal level for you as well as all things normal. And of course, normal standing national organization for the reform of marijuana laws in Canada. Um, and uh, something I've been involved with stateside since the late 70s. So, I mean, I think this is great tonight. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's crazy. Normal was founded in 1970. Like it was, <laughs> it's it's been like over 50 years. Am I doing the math? Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty close. Pretty close to 50 years. I see, I see there on the website that uh, it was what here in Canada was what 1978. Yeah, no, that, they didn't yeah. arrive. In 
extended until like 79 or 80. Um, I was doing a petition to bring them here in 78, and, and that's when mm. the push was on to expand into Canada was in 78. But they finally arrived here, I believe, in 1980. So there you go. Yeah, you've been, uh, it's been here for over 40 years. That's yeah. crazy. It's really yeah. amazing to see how much things have progressed. And now we stand to be the leader for federal legalization for other countries throughout the world. So it's, we're really in the spotlight. And I think, you know, everybody's had time to catch their breath since legalization. So now we can make informed criticisms and sort of improvements along the way, which may be you know, it, it, there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions immediately following legalization, a lot of criticism, you know, beforehand. But now that things have fallen into place, we can really get to work. Yes, absolutely. yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, Genoa, what uh, we normally do here is I will pass you over to Kim. She'll get fired away with the questions at you, and uh, I will jump in along the way. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I'll appreciate that. Um, Genoa, your, uh, your experience in cannabis, uh, you're not new to the scene, that's for sure. Um, I'd <laughs> no. For our listeners out there that don't know who you are, let's give them an overview of who Genoa McLean is. Uh, how did you get started in the cannabis industry? Give us a backstory. Uh, how did you gravitate towards the cannabis scene? Okay, so... Uh, my partner, Lorenzo, and I, uh, we both decided to open a cannabis business in my hometown in Kingston back in, in 2010. Um, mostly just to get the party going. We both, like, we both like to smoke weed. We were both very active as far as, um, you know, trying to advocate for legalization even back then. And you know, back then it was like an actually like <laughs> was a rebel thing to do because Stephen Harper was yeah. still prime minister and, you know, it was, yeah. uh, <laughs> it was a crazy time. Um, and then um, we just really grinded it out. We, we started just, you know, selling bonds and seeds and then um, we owned 420 Kingston. So we, we were supplying a lot of the seeds um that Canadians were growing with between 2010 and, and 2017. Ultimately, in 2017, uh, we got raided for our um, <laughs> for allegedly importing seeds from Europe. And hilariously, when they were there, um, we were ultimately arrested for um, our involvement with the the List Cannabis Cup, and List yeah. Weekend is coming. <laughs> So we were we were arrested, and I, I spent four hours in jail for my lift cup, <laughs> and then um, you know about thirteen months going in and out of court. Um, we were charged with possession for the purpose of trafficking for for having those uh, <laughs> lift entries there, um, but that charge was luckily reduced to simple possession, and ultimately we were able to apply for pardon. Uh, meanwhile, we, we, during this time, um, we were also developing our, our current brand that, that we're focused on for the, as soon as we, we thought that Ontario would privatize sales, we started developing calyx and trichomes. And then, um, lucky for us, we, we, well, unluckily, we went through the two lotteries and the losers both times there too. <laughs> But finally got our license to sell cannabis um, last year. And we are actually number one for cannabis sales, for legal recreational cannabis sales in the eastern region, which is um, anywhere east of the GTA, and that includes Ottawa. So we're doing quite well from our little Kingston store. Uh, we expanded to a, a second store, and, and really the, the sky's the limit for that one, too. We're just... <laughs> starting to gain traction there as well. And I, I think we're, we're doing really well. So it's, we've, we've sort of seen every side of it. And the whole time I've, you know, we've always supported normal. Um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to um, sort of 
jump in on the board as well. I was I was focusing on retail inclusion. So my whole um, advocacy was focused around other people transitioning from the unregulated market uh, into the regulated one like we did and sort of advocating that way. Um, and then just a couple of weeks ago, I was promoted to executive director. So it's been now it's my turn to sort of clean up what's left to clean up of, of the law and hopefully we can we can affect some real change because it's, we're not that far away like we've already gotten over the big hump we've already legalized it now we just need to clean it up <laughs> yeah 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 a lot of uh, a lot of people are um are anxious for it to get cleaned up so to speak legalization being rolled out is is a great milestone for this country um the regulations the restrictions um that are still accompanied legalization and still criminalize and demonize uh consumers as well as business people still need work oh yeah i mean it's we we're seeing issues I mean, especially considering it's a legal market that we're job providers. And I mean, of course, it's not a perfect industry. Of course, there's shadiness that that happens. But there's also a lot of really good, hardworking people that are putting everything they have, like me and my partner, into this industry and really trying to make something of it. You know, it's it's no different than... um, you know, a brewery that a family owned brewery, it's it's a pretty it's a wholesome enough thing that our local breweries have, you know, family events <laughs> their thing. Yeah. So I don't see why it's different for cannabis. So there's a there's there's definitely a lot of stigmatization. There's a lot of nimbyism still. You know, we don't mm. have lounges. Growing is an issue in some places. Federally there's issues. So yeah, it's I mean, there's, there's yeah. lots of room for improvement. There's still a lot of work. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, shadiness. I mean, you find shadiness. I, I don't know there's there's any business platform out there that, that doesn't have an element of shadiness, depending on who the proprietors are or the people that are participating. That's part of life everywhere, from from family life to business, no matter what the business I just I think the focus on that with cannabis is um, is a spotlight rather uh, uh, rather than a pen light like it is in other businesses, and I think that's that's an issue. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's it's we'll get there though. Like you know, it's, yeah, <laughs> we'll get there. It's, it, when when Absolutely. alcohol prohibition and you know you had to slide your order across a desk where somebody would go and retrieve it for you like a library book now yes it's self-serve you know so it's it's, there's there's definitely hopefully we get there faster (laughs) (laughs) yeah absolutely but i mean it's progress It's, it's progress not perfection yet but it's you know even in the time that I've been a legal um, cannabis retailer you know when I first started uh, in June of last year that's when my final inspection for for our location was complete and we were able to open our doors and sell cannabis um, when we first started there was like 25 registrar standards and now it's knocked down to like 11. So it's, they're they're finding their own redundancies. They're like, okay, you know, we don't need to be monitoring these specific things this closely. It's there's improvement is happening. Things are getting better because you just sort of have to see it play out to notice where the mm. the pain points and the redundancies are. Yeah, exactly. Learning to walk. Yeah, learning to walk, that. right? Like, I mean, that's that's what we're doing. We're learning to walk. You mentioned your business. I want to dive into that. Let's talk a little bit about Calyx and Tricones. Um, now, you yeah. evolved into it's legal sales, so it's an OCS here in, in, in the province of Ontario. Ontario Cannabis Store is what all our stores are governed under by the provincial government. So you put in an application when we still had the lottery. Uh, 
that, I mean, <laughs> Ontario was the worst at the flip-flopping on deciding on how we were going to roll this out. Uh, that lottery I, system, a lot of people just were, were pulling their hair out with that. That was quite the ordeal, right? Heartbreaking, honestly. It was really like a lot of hurry up and wait. It was heartbreaking to see, you know, 25 people live my dream. And I always said from the beginning that they'll need the head start. <laughs> so, like it's fine yeah. to open up to that head start because as soon as me and other people like me and my partner that like OGs of the market actually get into the market, those stores won't last. And, and it's, it's really starting to, you know, take on like, it's not, not everybody who um, owns a cannabis store is making out like a bandit. And in fact, lots of people are, are doing poorly, but a lot of that is caused in part by uh, the province holding off with applications and putting a hold with the lottery system. So like, had that not happened, maybe we wouldn't be seeing the clustering that everybody's complaining about. Had that not happened, you know, the market would have already sorted itself out by now. And ultimately, I, I personally believe that the whole lottery was just a way to, I mean, it was an election year. So mm. maybe it was a way to make the federal liberals look less competent, like, legalized so that they couldn't claim legalization as a victory during re-election because the largest province completely failed i mean there were right. it was at a point 25 stores is bananas it was so oh. low oh yeah you know oh i remember so, that <laughs> you know it's 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 crazy to see that there are still you know the mississaugas and the um, I, I, there's there's a there's a handful of it's, it's, Pickering. Are, I think did Pickering opt in eventually, or are they still out? Because that'd be another big center. Because I know I'm at one time. Sure. Then I think Pickering's in. It's really Mississauga is the big one right now. Mississauga is a big um, one, yes. And they they just opted out. Mar- of, just voted again to not not allow them. Yeah, and there's really not a lot of there's not a lot of like reason why. I mean, it's it's all it's all pandering to, in my opinion, an aging population that, you know, is worried about people walking around like drugged out zombies in the street. Hey, hey, Meanwhile, with- hey, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's no. what I That's my you, you described us to a T here uh, where I live. Yeah, our Miss Bowery. Where I live. Where I live. The prevalence yeah. well, of drugs I- in the community. <laughs> <laughs> people are just completely doing it anyways and they're only yeah. encouraging an, an unregulated market to proliferate they're only encouraging shady sales to happen they're only encouraging unregulated dispensaries to operate uh, and it's there it's not that there's ever been any danger with cannabis so there's no real reason why they sh- they should be concerned about that i mean but whatever criminal elements that they're concerned about, they need to be more concerned if they've got vacancies up and down their streets because of how seriously affected by the pandemic everybody is. Yeah, you know, yeah, they exactly. need to be more about fixing the potholes and more about going on in cannabis businesses. Yeah, At least you know, then, once, once the roads are perfect, then we can start accepting criticism. <laughs> because when you look at, yeah. like, we report on the news here on the network. You know, twice a week we've got yeah. shows on here, and the um, you know we're not reporting about towns being devastated. What we're reporting on is is the the amount of the stores. People are complaining about the amount of stores. They're not complaining about the effect of the stores, what they've done. You know, yeah. as far as being a negative on a community, or whether it's, it's turned a, a section of, po- of a population into a, a you know a negative end of uh, society. Uh, all they're complaining about, holy smokes, look at all those stores, you know, convenience have stores. Have we ever seen a news story? Have we ever heard a news story about the amount of Tim Hortons stores in the city of Toronto or the amount of, of LCBOs or beer stores? Gas stations. They don't do stories on that. Literally any business anywhere ever. Like, it's just, it's just, a, it's, it's demonizing. It's just, yeah. and it's an easy thing. 
it's um you know for maybe more socially conservative um areas who are not maybe cannabis users mm. themselves because cannabis users themselves aren't usually complaining about it and, and the fact of the matter is like those places will otherwise be vacant. Like you want yeah. restaurants in your city, you want, you know, cool places for people to hang out. Well then open them. We want cannabis stores. So that's why we're opening them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a very well, good we, cook. we celebrated an ice cream store. So, uh, yeah, well, Oh yeah. I was- Store, but we got a, yeah yeah <laughs> which I, it's actually the ice cream store opened up in the former um location of uh of a cannabis accessory store you know for bongs and pipes and stuff like that and he tried to sell the cannabis but when he went to the municipality they voted it down for the second time and he had you know he had a delegation that spoke for like an hour and 15 minutes and they shot it down in like five minutes it just it was. It was just really embarrassing. It, it really was. It's really like it makes it's. It's not even. It's not even logic based. If they're if they're worried about the driving, like you guys were saying, like it's been proven that. I mean, there's no increased driving issues. No effect. Like yeah. No effect at all. <laughs> you know, youth consumption you know. rate. Youth consumption rates have gone down. I don't know why a community, whether it's Mississauga or you know, little town where I am, you know, thinking that uh, that having a store is going to increase youth consumption, and it's that just didn't, that just didn't make the, the that, stats don't play that out. They don't play that out, like no, no. If you look no. at places like they Netherlands. The Netherlands are the perfect example of educa- education as a means of mitigation. So with their, um, with, for example, they, with their school kids, kids in kindergarten start learning about um, like sex education, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they have like, it starts really young, but they completely destigmatize it. Um, and guess where has the lowest teen pregnancy rate in the world <laughs> the netherlands <laughs> because people aren't rushing to have sex and in fact apparently according to a study a couple years old now but the same kids were waiting to have sex and it's the same thing is going to happen with cannabis if yeah. we destigmatize cannabis use you know if kids know that when they're an adult they can have it like why why would they be wasting their time with it now and the fact of the matter is I mean, if you have an unregulated zone, you're just, incur- I mean, not that anybody, not that everybody sells drugs to kids, but the fact is, is I absolutely do not sell drugs to kids. So if we have regulated stores and regulated locations, it, you know, you can ensure for sure that your kids aren't going to have access to cannabis because our whole livelihood rides on that. <laughs> so, well, yeah, what's... Course- when it comes to that, uh, uh, for the youth to get cannabis from a cannabis store, they actually have to act, go into the store to get it. And yeah. the procedure, what, like, to tell you the truth, I haven't been in a store. Like, you know, we opted out. You know, our closest store is, you know, over, an, well, now it's not over an hour away, but it was over an hour away at one point. The, um, yeah. So the procedure, like I know I've read in the past about at one time they were having ID checked at the door. Yeah, that's like, what we have. We have a literal door person. It's it's a huge waste of um, energy and, quite frankly, my staff talent um, having them stand at the door and check ID. When and and the reason why I think it's an issue totally like other than having to of course <laughs> pay for that those staffing hours it's, it's a huge burden for stores to take on but it's mostly like, ridiculous because in the same parking lot where we're located there's an lcbo across the way which kids can easily walk into yeah and then and a side issue of this is that the people that would typically need to be bringing their children with them are single mothers so this is sort of it's it's not that there's not also single fathers but most most of the time women are the ones doing the child care 
And it's usually women in our experience mm. that we've had to turn away with strollers because they we can't let kids in. Quite frankly, and, and this is something we want to address with normal as well, I, I it's completely it's it's completely ridiculous and we want to make sure that um families have the same access to cannabis that parents have the same access to cannabis than than their non than their childless childless counterparts it's it's well it, it's, 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 it's the old thing is ridiculous right i mean you're you're shopping for a legal product you can you can go into um a sex store that sells sex toys with a stroller. You can go into an LCBO with a stroller. You can go into a beer store with a stroller. Uh, you can go into the grocery store that sells alcohol with a stroller, but you can't go into a cannabis store. I mean, they're equating it along the same lines as a strip joint. That's completely, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. They're taking, they're taking the worst of the tobacco laws the worst of the pornography laws and the worst of the alcohol laws, the the toughest of all of those laws and making those the cannabis laws when, I mean, <laughs> we all know that cannabis is the safest <laughs> of all of them. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. now, th- is it because maybe they want to come in hard, have the th- two thumbs down on everything and they find it would be easier to relax things versus trying to reel things in? Well, how about just going so. in with a sense of common sense? Well, yeah, I know, I know <laughs> that, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I agree, Kim. I agree, Kim. <laughs> you know, I mean, they they went way over the top for this stuff. They really did. Well, they really. I mean, yeah. It's, in in any negotiation, you don't start with your lowest ball offer, and they certainly made it high. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it will it will relax. Ultimately, we will see, but it's it's going to take the work of of normal and and other um, advocacy groups to be able to achieve that. Yeah, because otherwise absolutely. they'll stay the same. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. there's nothing yeah. more than they and love. And speaking of normal, people. yeah, and speaking yeah. of normal, I want to dive into normal Canada. Um, you know, of course, you know, as I said before, this is this is the, what got me started was petitioning to bring normal to Canada way back when in the late 70s. And I was thrilled to death when you uh, when the org finally got here. And I've been working on and off with them ever since and uh, supporting them fully. So I'm anxious to dive into normal Canada in 2021 with a new leader at the helm. But I know. Al wants to go to commercial first. That's right, because that's <laughs> because that's normally what we do at the bo- break at the bottom of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when we return, we'll continue our discussion with our guest, Jenna Way McLean, uh, the executive director of Normal Canada and also the owner of Calyx and Tricones. Uh, this is the Pace Radio Show. We are live here at paceradio.net. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at Pace Radio. .net. BMA Hydroponics has everything you need to succeed. Visit our hydroponic superstore at 404 Maitland Drive in Belleville and we'll show you how to grow your own quality cannabis for pennies per gram. We're open Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Thursdays and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Call 613-967-9888. BMA Hydroponics, it's worth the drive. The only way to go. CTCP operates a medicinal cannabis signing clinic. If you want to grow your own medicinal cannabis and are located anywhere in Canada, then I'd like to suggest that you give them a call. They can be reached at 1-613-967-9888. That's 1-613-967-9888. And grow on with CTCP. The Pace Radio Network is the place to be for all your information from the world of psychedelics because we are pleased to bring our listeners two shows focusing on psychedelic therapy in the world of natural medicine. First up, we have Open Your Eye, which airs on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Open Your Eye is a 90-minute video podcast with Kim Cooper and Cindy Howell interviewing patients and professionals in the space. 
patient stories, facilitators, lawyers, and others discuss their journeys and endeavors involving psychedelic medicine. But they're not done because Kim and Cindy are back on alternate Tuesdays at 7 p.m. with psychedelic reporters as they bring along the show's mascot, Bufo, a.k.a. the Colorado Mud Toad, who is scouring the news wires for all the latest in psychedelic news. He then passes it on to Kim and Cindy to cover in this 60-minute video news podcast. So tune in every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern for Psychedelic Tuesdays right here on the Pace Radio Network, found at paceradio.net. A doctor's job is to relieve your pains. And when it comes to growing cannabis, the biggest pain is trimming. Let Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions take the pain away. Whether you're a home grower or a commercial operation, we have the cure. From four plants to 400 plants, garden size doesn't matter. Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions comes to you with years of experience and professional discreet service. It's simple. We trim your weed and we do a damn good job. Visit drbuckcts.com to book your or trimming. Enjoy the buzz of legalization with Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. From lights to plant nutrients, books, consumption accessories, and more, we've got all your basics to grow or consume cannabis. Visit our info center or take a look at our piercing services and body jewelry, now available in store through Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. 17 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. The People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada is an organization working to improve cannabis legalization in Canada. They have a mission and values that includes all Canadians, no matter where they come from. The values are including everyone, as no one should be excluded from participating, equality, diversity, advocacy, along with cannabis education and research, plus industry, safety, and professional standards. If this is an organization that has the same values as you, check them out at People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada dot ca. Once again, People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada dot ca. Check them out. At Legacy 420, we believe in being different. Experience the difference of quality control. Our labs provide tested formulations for all of our products. Experience the difference in trust. Our customers can trust that we are following up-to-date COVID precautions for their safety. Experience the difference in accessibility. We're open seven days a week. Please visit our website, Legacy420.com, or contact us for curbside pickup as well as nationwide mail order shipping. Legacy 420 values overall wellness. Come and experience the difference of Legacy 420. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. Hello and welcome back. You're listening to the Pace Radio Show. We are live here at paceradio.net. And if you don't catch the live show, don't forget you can always catch the podcast afterwards at paceradioshow.com or paceradio.net. Tonight in the program, we are joined by our guest. Jenna Way McLean of the Executive Director of Normal Canada and the owner of Calyx and Tricones, as well as, well as my joint host Kim Cooper is here as well. Well, ladies, uh, we had quite the conversation there in the first segment. We're going to get into the, some oh. normal stuff, eh? In the seg- second yeah. segment? Yeah. No. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Some normal stuff. We've got some comments though that you wanted from to Ron. Over, yeah, think. yeah. Ron's got some comments here. Ron says that there's shady people in 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 every industry, and singling out cannabis businesses just perpetuates the stigma and reefer badness. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Spotlights. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's he's yep. he's you know he's in an hour and a half distance from a store, um, so you know he's not close to one either. And um, he he brings up the same thing we were talking about the liquor stores and beer stores and you know beer stores beer is in grocery stores. You can go to Walmart now and get uh, beer and that or alcohol, and that's taken like a hundred years. So let's hopefully that doesn't happen here with the cannabis issue. Yeah, and yeah, you know, another, absolutely. another real issue is that the province, the OCS, is right now the only um, the only group that's allowed to ship cannabis through the mail. Like, you can personally ship it to anybody, but I, as a retail store, I'm not allowed to ship cannabis anywhere. So oh. um, they recently 
change that in Alberta so that Alberta retailers will be handling mail order cannabis. Um, but <sighs> yeah, like if you guys live an hour and a half away from a store and you're in a dry zone because nobody's opening up there, like I would love to ship to you. I would, I would, I really, it's really a huge, a high item agenda issue for Ontario specifically and for all provinces is to allow retailers to conduct their own business. It's bananas. Yeah, well, Alberta, with, yeah. situ- with their situation, there was something about, there was only like 1% of their sales. So really, it probably didn't, yeah. pay, it didn't pay for them to keep it open or operating. And the, the other, when I talk to my contacts at the OCS, they tell me that their end, like their consumer sales are like less than what we do in a day for a whole month. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's, yeah. they not a lot and it only looks like they have a lot of inventory because when something comes in, they get one box and the rest goes to the wholesale distribution channel. So I, it's really not a priority from them. The volume is so low. There's not a lot of repeat mm-hmm. customers because maybe some tries one thing and then goes and gets it from their regular retailer or, you know, there's over a thousand stores in the province now and, Outside of sort of far-flung places, um, you know, it's the opposite where there's clustering issues. So, yeah, it's 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 definitely high on the agenda. If we can ship to people, that would be great. And it's also like logical because Canada Post is already handling it; they can already really? do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just the person who's sending yeah. it out. So, <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Exactly. And, and and yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Warehouse. It's just yeah, it's, yeah, like you know, how many people order liquor from the liquor store, or you know, through to be delivered in the mail? I know it's, I think it's last I understood it was available to do that, but who does it? I, I, I well, I, I don't, yeah, not that I would do like I've sent, I've gone to like wineries in DC before and shipped yeah. bottles home to myself because. You know, I didn't want to pay extra luggage fees, but that's the... That's... <laughs> Dial the bottle. Dial, up. Dial the bottle. Uh, all right. Down for two, two decades. Dial the bottle. I mean, you can you can call up and you can call a delivery service. They go to the liquor store for you. They get you your booze and they deliver it to your door. It's called Dial the Bottle. It was around 20 years ago and they've still got versions of that so we can get alcohol and so forth delivered but they're not allowed yeah. to do it for cannabis yeah mm. dial a bottle um exists in kingston like it is a thing in kingston you know yeah it, well it's it, around 20 years ago <laughs> uh, well uh, belleville had dialogram uh that was that was several years ago too but um <laughs> <laughs> That's well, I don't see why it shouldn't be. Like, why can't yeah. delivery? Like, why, why can't we be on Uber Eats? Like, if if you're trusting the skip the dishes driver, the Uber driver, yeah. to um, check ID if you order wine from a restaurant, which you we've mm-hmm. been able to do since the pandemic. Yeah, um, which is now permanent. I mean, yeah, it's really no different. But the difference is, is that delivery drivers all have to have can sell licenses. So. This is another thing that Ontario is is going to be allowing on an ongoing basis is is delivery and and yeah we they even the drivers have to have cancel which is absurd because you're serving people at home like can you check an ID that's all you need to do yeah <laughs> well they're, maybe they're looking at it is that is that person who's doing delivery who's doing the contact with the human on the other end would be the same as if being a, a representative at a store that is at the sales counter. I mean, that's technically supposed to be, I, that's really supposed to be the idea. Like, and, yeah. and to be fair, we be using our, our staff and my family members to do delivery <laughs> when we were doing uh, Yeah. Just because it's, it's, it's such a burden yeah. for retailers to do. Like, it's very mm. expensive to do it. Um, but we felt that it was a public service during the lockdown. We thought it was a really important thing to be able to do because, I mean, there was also a study that was put out that in places where cannabis is available, um, there's there's less domestic violence, and mm-hmm. specifically with being in, you know, everybody was cooped up together. Like we were just doing our part to keep the peace. 
<laughs> yes. And I, first, I think. Um, I know that Kim wanted to get into some normal conversation here. So let's switch over to normal. And I, I something tells me we're going to probably jump back and forth for the night on between normal and... Yeah, yeah. I would think so, yeah. There's, there's so much going on. Uh, it, it seems inevitable that that's going to happen for sure. But yeah, I do. I want to get into normal. Let's talk normal Canada a little bit here. Um, normal, near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm on the little website you guys launched a new website not too long ago uh and fairly cool website liking the format of it tell us about um the new normal now uh you're you're new at the helm first female head if i'm not mistaken every other executive director has been a male that i have worked with over the years uh i think you're the first female no, there's. I'm actually preceded by two other really strong women, or three other actually. I think the um, so before me. So that website actually, we're we're going to be working on doing an overhaul update, hopefully um, by the end of the month, um, because that one still lists me as the retail inclusion coordinator. Um, but we're going to be the, before me. It was. Karima Saad. Um, she's a lawyer from Toronto. Um, oh, oh, I forgot about Karima. Yeah. Yep. yeah, she does she does the the cartoon. She's really smart, really awesome. Um, she's she's just focusing on um, you know vaccination stuff right now and and other sort of human rights issues. So um, before her was Abby Roach. Um, Abby Roach, you might know, she was from I, Hot Box. I, we're familiar with Abby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Hot Box, yep. I've known Abby for many years, the Hot Box Cafe. She started off making jewelry in front of the friendly stranger. Yeah, Abby is, um, she's been one of my biggest supporters. and She's so um precious to me and 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 has also like because we both went through the the lottery held together um and her business the hot box was was ultimately bought out and then she started uh working with the ocs um so we've got someone good on the inside for sure she's she's been she's been wonderful and um before her was i think was abby sampson um so yeah, there's, there's been a I didn't know Abby I didn't know Abby Roach made it all the way to executive director. I had no idea about that. I lost connection with Normal for several years um while I was concentrating on my career here in the media with Al Graham for the last eight years or so. The last time I worked with Normal Craig was the executive director and was with John Conroy. Craig Jones? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so fun enough. Okay, Craig Jones is from Kingston as well. Yes. And his daughter yes. works for us at, at the store. His daughter. <laughs> oh, oh, really? His daughter's best friends and was at her baby shower last weekend. So, yeah, we, um, it's, it's there, uh, that he was, so that would have been, I think, he was the executive director of 2014 or 2015, I think. And then, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's when I was last time I was with Normal. Yeah. 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 And then, I, like, Abby's whole deal, of course, it was a bit of a conflict of interest for taking a, um, a role as a public servant and then also being on the lobbying side. So right. she, uh, she, she resigned and stepped down um, for that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so now... It's my turn to, and I'm I'm getting everything handed to me basically on a silver platter because it seems so very clear everything that needs to be improved. Like it doesn't seem to me like like it's so obvious. I think that previous executive directors might have felt, um, you know, like where like all of your energy has to be put into legalization, all of the energy has to just be directed this one way, but. Now we can focus on everything that needs to be improved instead of just being so 
so siloed and we can bring yeah. everybody together. So it, it just seems like a very direct and clear path forward because it's just like a few imp- like logical improvements that would reduce red tape and make the cannabis industry better for everyone. Oh, yes. Awesome. So tell us about those few logical conclusions. What what kind of red tape do you want to cut through? What's uh, what's normal's focus going to be going forward to uh, what kind of changes are you looking to see? Are you going to be advocating for? I see a few, but like the list is ever growing. And there's a lot of sort of big umbrella ideas that have a ton of tiny little ideas underneath it that needs to be fixed. Like there's there's nuances in every province. So um, my my main deal as executive director is that I want normal to be super inclusive of all of those things. I want to be focusing on patient advocacy and me- medical rights because, like, patients have always gotten the short end of the stick in terms of everything when it comes to cannabis. Like, it's shocking to me yes. that pre milk this is a top seller in the OCS, like, People never had an MMR on its toes. Well, <laughs> you know, like, Kim, Kim and uh, I, Kim and I have discussed. Um, there's there's things that patients lost when cannabis came legalized. For example, vapor yeah, lounges. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We no longer have a place to go when I, when I travel to Toronto I mean I'm seven hours eight hours north of Toronto I have family in the city friends in the city I'm from Toronto I love going back home and visiting Um, when I go down there if I'm staying in a hotel majority of the hotels you can't consume they don't want you to smoke in there Uh, and that includes cannabis so I mean I'm out on a shopping trip Uh, I'm shopping on Young Street I need a break because I'm a patient. I have, I have a back injury, so I need a break. You know, I pop into Vapor Central and spend an hour there and, and medicate, and then I can go back out and spend more of my dollars uh, in the city as a tourist. Um, all over the city, I had the opportunity to go into some place and, and consume and medicate uh, as, as I needed. I can't do that anymore. Yeah, and I mean, I used to own, we used to own a vapor lounge, actually. We we owned 420 Session, which was just above 420 Kingston. Um, and, you know, that is also a labor of love. Like, it, it, there needs to be some sort of regulation for consumption lounges, but we also need to find a way to make them profitable. There needs to be, like, like these need, consumption lounges need to be sort of, like, single serve um retail spaces where people can just go and buy a joint at a time or you know hit like the way that we used to like where you can buy dabs or whatever you know what i mean like there needs to be a damn coffee shop but it's not just that there's also like no access points um like yeah you can go and buy retail cannabis but you can't like we need more of these like hybrid farms to open up across the province as well you know where we where there's like patient access to medical cannabis and it's a retail outlet um and because i don't think that patients should be paying any tax whatsoever and that's what's happening and of course like the excise tax i i believe in taxing cannabis ultimately to improve our society i believe it doesn't need to be as taxed as high as it is. I don't, and, and we would still easily benefit um, the society with the tax revenue that we get. But 100% of my core belief system is, is fully that we should never tax patients. Most yes. patients are on a fixed income. Most patients are really not able to work at all because that's why they're patient, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just completely illogical to be taking more money from them. It, it, in fact, it should be subsidized. I, I, it's, it's, I yes. would go even a step yes. beyond. Yes. Yeah. So that's, and, that's, I, and I have said right from the beginning, be. we, we do have this, a, the, the, there should be yeah, a percentage of, of taxes. companies that are covering it. A percentage of the tax there collected is. should be going to a position in order to help fund cannabis for patients in need who can't afford it some type of absolutely yes there are some insurance companies that cover cannabis for patients Um, but it's not very few 
it's not that great either. The coverage yeah. is not good. And in some of its limited, limited some of its limited conditions. It's super yeah. limited conditions. You know, I, in fact, we provide benefits for our staff at Calix and Tricom. So um, I'm the one who chooses the benefits package. And of course, I wanted something that would cover cannabis, but I grow my own cannabis. So where's the subsidy there? They're not paying for my soil. They're not paying for my seeds. They're not, you know what I mean? Like, so like yep. really nothing yep. if you're growing your own. And then even on top of that, even if I was buying it, you know, there was like this convoluted health spending account where you could have cannabis covered. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that like veterans are getting their cannabis covered. That's awesome. Um, but it, it needs to be extended to people who are also on, I mean, if, if nothing else, if you can show that you're on a fixed income, like if you're an ODSP recipient, for example, you should 100% have your cannabis subsidized. Because okay. if people are, they're replacing tons of other medications mm. with it, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're becoming less um, to the system for the other drugs that they would otherwise need to be taking. So it's, My yep. hand's in it's, the air. My it's hand's in the air. Yeah, like they're just really not, they're not understanding the nuance. People just thought that when we legalize cannabis, that medical cannabis patients would be fine. But in fact, you know, now you're also limited with how much cannabis that you can carry. You know, like the, it's, I, I was previously, I previously had a license for like a hundred plants, something like that. And it's way more than what I personally needed. Like I'm actually a decent grower and I can get, you know, I can get a few pounds off of, off of my tent. So like I'm doing okay. Mm. And like for just me, I, I, it's fine, you know, right. but not everybody has that. And not everybody can grow. So yeah, there's, it's, there's so, it's, mm. it's so nuanced and they're just not ready. And, and so, yeah, medical, medical issues are my top priority. Um, I also want to make sure that we're bringing people together because the, the people who are super interested in, um, the, the medical issues may not understand the nuances of cannabis amnesty and the people who are lobbying for loosening marketing restrictions and, you know, which ultimately hopefully means that children um, aren't treated, <laughs> you know, families are, are able to attend cannabis stores the same way they are all CBOs. That would be a part of the marketing restrictions as well. Um they're yes. not going to be near yeah. like, could, they, where, they, where they I don't... was going with the, with the when I mentioned when I mentioned the um, the benefits and some insurance companies where where I was going to go with that was so it is happening on a small scale over only heavily very heavily restricted but that just means that it can happen so why isn't yeah. it widespread why isn't it on the ODSB drug card. Uh, that you can get this covered? Why isn't it part of your CPP uh, drug benefit package for senior citizens or those that are collecting early benefits due to injury? Um, it, if it's available on a small scale, it can be implemented on a large scale. They can no longer say, well, we can't cover it because it doesn't have a DIN number. And that was the original line, tagline that everybody wanted to use. It doesn't have a DIN, so we can't cover it. Well, they've obviously gotten over that part because some coverage is being allowed. Um, but it's so highly restrictive, it doesn't really apply to the majority of the population uh, that are cannabis patients. And it's also a lip service. The ones that are doing it are just trying to appear to be progressive mm -hmm. because, quite frankly, 20% of cannabis that you would have had to have purchased from a licensed producer, is that's, that's more than half that you charge for it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not it's a fair subsidy at all. So, yeah, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done improving that. Yeah. And that's also related to stigmatization as well. Sure. Um, and, and we're seeing it well with banks too, right? Like mm -hmm. that's another bank. Oh yeah. yeah. To be on. Oh, I, I, it's yeah. Stigmatized. I'll tell you when we, when <laughs> banks salivate over cannabis stores, they want our business, but don't want our business. So like some of the big five don't do cannabis stores at all. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But Bank Montreal wanted, it was like $7,000 or something like that for the, to process our application, not even to guarantee that we would have um, an actual like account out of a checking account to receive money in and pay bills with um, just for the, just for them to open our files. So anyway, we stuck with our credit union, which we're very happy with, but it's, it's a good example of, of the, the whole system just being completely, completely inaccessible um, and stigmatized still and, and really a challenge when it's, you know, it's like it's little things like this that we could just like get real with people and unlock and it would it would make mm. people's lives so much easier and it would make it would allow the cannabis industry to flourish. Yeah, I, yeah. I see it. Medicine, but this is also a huge business opportunity, and this is an opportunity for Canadians and the Canadian cannabis industry to take a step into a global spotlight where we can set the example for other mm-hmm. places coming online. Like it, and this is a sort of tenant of normal. It starts with um, you, you gain acceptance through the medical program and and destigmatize it that way, and then more people talk about, it, and then hopefully recreational legalization. So it's it's fully legalized and sold and regulated, you know, this model is, is hitting different countries throughout the world. So we're, you know, years away from being able to go and buy weed on vacation places, you know, it's already yeah. happening in some places, but yeah, yes. it's going to happen. So yeah, so that's yep. something else we want to focus on. Um, we want to make sure I... that we, we are all of these groups together. Um, we want to make sure that, um, Province by province, we're tackling issues with different key um, stakeholders. So patients, consumers, producers, even um, especially micro producers, um, basically anybody who would be affected, we want to make sure that we understand every single thing. Like, I'll have to admit, I, you know, other than access issues in sort of northern places like Northwest Territories and Nunavut and um, like the Yukon, for example, I'm not really aware of um, any, uh, any of the little nuances that are happening there. You know, it's not like we have licensed producers that are clamoring to get into the Northwest Territories, but why, why not? I would love to be smoking light like northern lights under the northern lights that should be a- <laughs> <laughs> well you know the lights have been very bright lately so no it's true yeah. it's true yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, I mean, like, you may have been <laughs> even even hydroponic growing like it could be a whole industry up mm-hmm. there you know what i mean like yeah it's yeah. just it's completely not being i i appreciate that the law was written from what they consider to be a public safety standpoint, but it's 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 bordering on like Big Brother. Strangulation. <laughs> it's, it's beyond border. Yeah. It's beyond border. Yeah. It's ten miles <laughs> over the border. It's it's hovering over like a, a black cloud. Um, you know, harms of cannabis. We had a thriving cannabis industry and a thriving cannabis community that was, uh, you know, out there, stores everywhere, lounges everywhere across this country. Uh, I experienced many of them and they were all willing to pay taxes and stood there with their hand out saying, yes, please take my money. Give me a license. We have testing equipment. We'll be great. Let's make a deal. And they we gave us what we have and destroyed an entire industry and decided to build it again from the ground up with some very crooked bricks. Um, We're going to get to more with you and Normal Canada and what you guys got on tap in the future after our next break. That's right, yes, because I've got that list in front of me and there's a couple there I'd like to bring up. But just so you know, on the uh, patients and saving money with drug companies and stuff like that, we do have a comment from Ron. He says cannabis saves saves the taxpayers uh, $50,000 a year just for him alone. Well, there you go, right? There you like, go. Yeah. Proof is in the pudding. Proof exactly. is in the pudding. So. That's right. That's right. Okay, off to break we go. Um, 
and uh, we'll be right back uh, after that. After we go for break, we have uh, our guest here, Genoa McLean, uh, the executive director of Normal Canada, and you're listening to Pace Radio Show, and we'll be back in about four minutes. You're listening to the Pace Radio okay. Network here at paceradio.net. At Legacy 420, we believe in being different. Experience the difference of quality control. Our labs provide tested formulations for all of our products. Experience the difference in trust. Our customers can trust that we are following up-to-date COVID precautions for their safety. Experience the difference in accessibility. We're open seven days a week. Please visit our website, Legacy420.com, or contact us for curbside pickup as well as nationwide mail order shipping. Legacy 420 values overall wellness. Come and experience the difference of Legacy 420. The Pace Radio Network is the place to be for all your information from the world of psychedelics because we are pleased to bring our listeners two shows focusing on psychedelic therapy in the world of natural medicine. First up, we have Open Your Eye, which airs on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Open Your Eye is a 90-minute video podcast with Kim Cooper and Cindy Howell interviewing patients and professionals in the space. Patient stories, facilitators, lawyers, and others discuss their journeys and endeavors involving psychedelic medicine. But they're not done, because Kim and Cindy are back on alternate Tuesdays at 7 p.m. with psychedelic reporters as they bring along the show's mascot, Bufo, a.k.a. the Colorado Mud Toad, who is scouring the news wires for all the latest in psychedelic news. He then passes it on to Kim and Cindy to cover in this 60-minute video news podcast so tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern for psychedelic tuesdays right here on the pace radio network found at paceradio.net enjoy the buzz of legalization with campbellford lifestyle shop from lights to plant nutrients books consumption accessories and more we've got all your basics to grow or consume cannabis Visit our info center or take a look at our piercing services and body jewelry. Now available in store through Campbellford Lifestyle Shop, 17 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. What do you find at paceradio.net? People advocating cannabis education. A doctor's job is to relieve your pains. And when it comes to growing cannabis, the biggest pain is trimming. Let Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions take the pain away. Whether you're a home grower or a commercial operation, we have the cure. From four plants to 400 plants, garden size doesn't matter. Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions comes to you with years of experience and professional discreet service. It's simple. We trim your weed and we do a damn good job. Visit drbuckcts.com to book your your trimming. CTCP operates a medicinal cannabis signing clinic. If you want to grow your own medicinal cannabis and are located anywhere in Canada, then I'd like to suggest that you give them a call. They can be reached at 1-613-967-9888. That's 1-613-967-9888. And grow on with CTCP. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like WIC, Ebb and Flow, Drip, or Aeroponic System, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net. Hey, welcome back and thanks for tuning in to Pace Radio Show. We are live here at paceradio.net. Tonight on the program, we are joined by our guest, Genoa McLean, Executive Director of Normal Canada and owner of Calyx and Tricones, a cannabis retail store located in Kingston, plus my joint toast, Northern Ontario, Kim Cooper is here. Well, ladies, uh, before the break, we we're talking about some of the things that Genoa had on her list to deal with, things that she'd like to touch on with Normal to improve in the cannabis end. 
Uh, we got to touch on a couple more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We got some, we got a whole bunch to cover. <laughs> yeah. I, yes. I think now, the big you know, the limits, if we're talking about limits on cannabis, I, I yep. think it's ridiculous that there's a 30 gram limit in store. I think it's ridiculous that um, your personal carry limit is 30 grams and that if you're medical, it's 150 because that's another flight to medical users. But yeah. Um, yeah. I, I also think that uh, the actual milligrams per package should not be limited either. Yes. Um, it's, it's, I, I think that it should be indicated, don't get me wrong, but, you know, a good example that I always have of, of the way that they do it in California, there's these really beautiful uh, Kiva bars in California, and they've got, they're like a, it's, I think it was 100 milligrams in the whole bar, it might have been 150, um, but each square was, was like, a, you know, specific amount so like if it was 100 mm. then each square was 25 milligrams or whatever and it just said like this is 25 milligrams <laughs> you know like if you eat the whole bar you eat 100 milligrams but like I don't think that people should be buying 10 10 milligram chocolate bars you know with all yes. of the extra waste that that's producing like it's mm. it's ridiculous you know yeah, the it, fact that yeah. one, one gram it, you know yeah, how many it is. I have, I have I'm, thousands of seeds. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if that one seed equals one gram. That's absurd. I mean, technically, uh, it can equal like thousands of grams, but it doesn't, in its current state, equal one gram. No, so, like, no. Definitely want to get rid of. Yeah, yeah, that that needs to be uh, uh, that needs to be changed for sure. There's the dosing. Well, like, especially even on, though, speaking as a patient. Both Al and I are patients, right? And speaking as a patient, using anything that comes from a legal store, if we wanted to go in there and, and you know, fill my prescription, so to speak, uh, in, in the OCS, um, my morning tea is 60 milligrams. Right. I mean, how much sugar would I have to consume to get yeah, 60 it's, milligrams for breakfast. How many teas would you'd have to have six teas, Kim? Like Christ, you'd be peeing all day, <laughs> <laughs> all damn <day and> night. <laughs> like, <laughs> so they they don't even make a product that can fill my prescription. Now they do, but they're just not very sexy. They're capsules. Capsules are great. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's you're still <laughs> you're taking a pill, but the capsule. So mine's that a you have, like, prescription, so I don't get a candy. I get to pit take a pill because it's a prescription, <laughs> even though it's the identical medicine that somebody else gets in a treat. Well, uh, don't forget the store. Now I'm being the, punished. The stores are recreational. But there are 10 yeah. milligram capsules that are, are the equivalent to, to the edible. So that's that's one way that I would do it. Yeah. And that's how I get around. Like, I'm so high on capsules all the time. It's how I live my life. Interesting. Like, always. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, just... and see, I, I, I don't like capsules. Just taking the, my medicine in a capsule, for me, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a recovering prescription addict. I was prescribed 16 I pills see. a day and 150 milligrams of fentanyl on top of those 16 pills a day. And I was a zombie wow. for 10 years. Now I look at a pill or anything in a capsule and I want to vomit. Um, it's sure. not something I'm interested in doing at all. So it's prohibitive to me. It's, you know, I, I mean, to me, yeah. I mean, I'm putting a natural medicine in a pill. Um, that just doesn't jive yeah. for me, not at all. I, I, I can appreciate that. Like, it's I it's it's a workaround that's not mm. a very good workaround. Yeah. Ultimately, people should be able to buy um, chocolate bars that have yeah. 100 milligrams in them. Like, it's, like <laughs> and then just if, don't eat the whole thing like an if, adult. It's just if like not, how if I buy a big yeah. bottle of tequila, I don't drink the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like. See the, it, 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 it is. I had all these products at my disposal pre-legalization in the gray market, and then yeah, legalization exactly. came, and now I can't go to the store and buy it anymore. I'm I've been punished by legalization, effectively. Yeah, I I appreciate that. I yeah. it's totally, and, and it's also like the 
it's the people who are making the laws are not the ones that are living the laws on either side. Right. They're not, yeah. they're yeah. not retailers. Yeah, exactly. Because they... even as a retailer, like that's another thing. We're not allowed to discuss medical issues Correct. with a retailer, right? Yes, We're not right. allowed to talk about this and it's a fact. So it's, that, it's so heavily like, regulated. And, and quite frankly, it's, I'm not qualified to, I'm not a doctor, mm, right? No. Like I, I'm happy to talk to you about how I like to get high because that's my recreation. Now, if we want to talk patient to patient, you know, I'm still not a doctor. I can tell you what works for me patient to patient Mm -hmm. outside of the store, but it it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like it's still, I'm not, I'm not, I'm only an expert on what works for me. And that's the thing with cannabis that, you know, we sort of have to impress on people, especially because nobody's, we sell CBD. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not CBD. Yeah. Is, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. CBD, uh, like even 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 the even the capsules themselves. That's always been something that a patient has taken, and a capsule and a pill has yeah. always been something that someone takes to deal with an illness, and a capsule or a pill has always been something that the government has used or people of authority have used to demonize drug users, and now sure. they're selling them. At a store as recreational use because, like, unless it, 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 you're yeah. in Quebec. Yeah, well, unless yeah, you're unless in you're Quebec. in Quebec. Yeah. I, they outlawed the topicals and they outlawed anything that's medicinal and it's not actually recreational. They're not allowed to sell it. Yeah, the Quebec laws are really dumb, and in fact, they also raise the the minimum age. What, meanwhile, <laughs> you know, like you can cross the border at 18 and get a beer, but you know, yeah. they, they made the, they, they increased the age to 21, <laughs> you know, Quebec, I, I, I am glad I'm not a 20 year old in Quebec, you know, like, <laughs> and, and is that really going to stop you smoking? And also like, what are we talking about? Like a 20 year old is an adult. Oh, like, it's hilarious. Adults, and, it's hilarious. You know, it's, it's, it's it is hilarious. really, it, it is just, you can, just you so can, ridiculous. You can send. You I'm in a seven. burp border town. Quebec is 20 minutes away from me. So we've got all our 18-year-olds yeah. that grow up around here. Their 18th birthday, they go over the border to Quebec, and there's a bar there. So they go over to the strip joint, and they and they go and they get drunk for their 18th birthday when you live here in Ontario because you can drink there yeah. a year early. And then we've got all of the 18 to 21-year-olds that live on the Quebec side coming over to our town and going to the OCS. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> How embarrassing, yeah. isn't it? Um, and it's, yeah. it's pretty ridiculous. It, it, so yeah, it, it yeah. Really, it, it really it is. You know, at eighteen, you can watch you can watch uh, you know uh, ladies take their clothes off on a stage. You can go to yeah. war. You can go to war, but you can't you, you can't, can't smoke a joint. Life. Like what the hell? So. Okay, now uh, another thing that you <laughs> that uh, you sent out in your your in your text there is something that is is uh, beneficial all across the country, province to province. It's a nationwide thing, as far as I'm concerned. It's a benefit to recreational users. It's a benefit to patients. It's a it's a benefit to communities. Um, we've had uh, cannabis lounges in the past for 20 years. They have not been a problem for communities whatsoever, but when legalization came, they were banned, basically due to laws, uh, smoking laws, so on and so forth. Uh, I see in here, you like the idea of consumption lounges. Oh, of course. It's a, it's, it's completely, uh, but like I say, I want consumption lounges, but I also want them to be able to be set up for success because exactly. as somebody who used to own a consumption lounge, like you know, you're not, you're not retiring from that money. Like you're not taking a lot of money as just a consumption lounge, just selling, um, pop and chips. So I would like to see consumption lounges be also like retailers or, you know, retailers that have outdoor spaces as patios, at least if nothing else, you know, like Uh, we, we, I would also, to that end, like to see an amendment in the smoke free Ontario act, because there's no reason why, cannabis smoke and vapor needs to be treated and demonized the same as cigarette smoke. I would like to see the studies. And that is another thing we need to deal with is more real studies proving that and not anecdotal evidence, because right now, um, you know, there's, there's definitely no evidence on their side, 
but all of our evidence for the most part is anecdotal. So we want to see some real studies funded as well so that once and for all, we can just shut them up. It's separate. We know it's not. We know cannabis smoke and vapor is not the same thing as cigarette smoke. And it shouldn't be treated that way. No, it shouldn't Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And, and it's, on, it's I, on Ontario government for sure. Pre-legalization, the Ontario government purposely added vaping uh, yeah. into yeah. the smoke-free Ontario laws. And that happened immediately. Um, and that, yeah. that, was, that had a purpose. And that was because cannabis was becoming legal. Uh, and that's why they did it. They did it to shut down the lounges. Because when we're doing yeah. vaporization only in the lounges, it was the way around the Smoke-Free Ontario Act. And, uh, and they, were, they were fine. Legalization comes, they add in vaping, and everybody's the, out of business. Yeah, they add in the word cannabis. Because before it was tobacco, yeah. it was just tobacco, right? It was yeah, just but they tobacco. added vaping. Pre-legalization, yeah. they added vaping. It was just smoking just... prior to that. Pre-legalization, they made it smoking and vaping. Mm. And uh, that's what that's what did it. Yeah, it's um, they definitely were targeting. And I even met with our member of parliament at the time, Sophie Koala. And, you know, I can tell that the Smoke Free Ontario Act amendment that happened in 2016, like I met with her in 2015, she even came into the vapor lounge and everything. And she was like, well, you know, it takes lots of time to pass through, like, don't shut down just yet. And I was like, you just you just made everything we do here illegal. So if I don't shut down now, are you going to be sending people? And I, I swear, within weeks, I had KFLNA health units sending people up trying to see if we were still operating as as a vapor lounge we changed it and then we just made it an office space but yeah it was they were they were enforcing it like right away right so it's yeah yeah Yeah. it was a targeted action for sure yeah the 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 lounges in you know toronto um you know there were several that were there the uh, they they set an example uh, and there's no reason why you can't take off of, from the alcohol end of things in bars. Uh, they offer their patrons entertainment. You know, vapor lounges can offer yeah. entertainment, you know, uh, from yeah. bands to comedians, uh, game nights, whatever. You know, I there are different had things. great time at yeah. vapor lounges. You and I have gone to several oh. over the years, Al, and been... You know, comedy acts and, and you know, band singers, um, karaoke, okay. uh, you, know, you name it. And it's going on. Yeah. We, we've even had board game nights yeah, uh, in yeah. some of the lounges and stuff. You know, euchre tournaments. Um, <laughs> the, the list yeah. is endless. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's really ridiculous that it has to be this. I mean, it's, it, it, was, it was a real, like using a sledgehammer when you know a little tap would have been just fine with with that law so now we're just we just got to build that wall back up and you know that we need to show that there's a distinct difference and I, I i think things will change for the better but yeah consumption lounges um are for sure important yes. um yeah not not just yeah. cannabis culture but it's also you know, there's lots of places that are trying to ban smoking altogether, like lots of apartments, new leases. People need a place to smoke cannabis. Yes, yeah. Like you want to smoke it in the street because that's, that's the option. If I can't smoke it in my house and I can't smoke it in a safe, comfortable, tucked away, out away from, you know, your kids, like I'll just smoke it walking down the street because newsflash, the entire province is my vapor lounge then. I can smoke yeah. anywhere that cigarettes are allowed to be smoked. I can smoke anywhere. So, I mean, I can't smoke on playgrounds, I think, but anywhere no. that cigarettes are allowed, smoke. So, if you mm. want to add to that, okay. Oh, there's <laughs> there's places that have added to that, like such as you're not allowed to even smoke on the sidewalks or walking down the street, like. <laughs> You know, yeah, like, there are some yeah. municipalities that have enacted that. Richmond Hill is one of them. You're not allowed to smoke walking down the street now. And that came with uh, with cannabis being rolled into the same laws as smoking under smoke-free Ontario. I, I take I take it personally. I really do. These these kind of things that we've talked mm. about tonight um, th- that need to be changed in, in the Cannabis Act because I really do look at the legalization 
Um, it came on the backs of patients. Patients were the big losers in legalization, and almost every aspect we talked about tonight has come on the backs of patients. We lost our lounges. I mean, now if I go shopping in Toronto, I have the option of standing outside in January when it could be minus 20 degrees and snowing with my backache, uh, standing on a street corner consuming my meds. Oh, well, that's that's appealing, isn't it? Uh, you know, the taxation yeah. in the store for me to go and get meds on the fly if I'm, I'm out and about and I need to get some meds because I don't have enough on me because my carry amount went down uh, with legalization. Yeah. So now I have to purchase in an OCS. Well, I've got to either take a pill or consume enough sugar to last me for a week. Those are my two options. Yeah. And then I can be taxed up the ass for it. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, I'm not thrilled, I got to say. Yeah, it's definitely, there's no denying in any any cannabis, anybody who has benefited from the cannabis industry that doesn't acknowledge patients first as the whole reason why we're here in the first place um, is, quite frankly, full of shit. Am I allowed mm. to say that? So I can't, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see um, how rights have been taken away. And that's why I, I put patients first. And that's why I think normal, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're coordinating with all patient groups and to make sure that everybody's voices across the country in far flung places are heard mm -hmm. because yeah. everybody's, everybody's experience is completely different. So we all yeah. need to work together. We're all on the right track and we're all working towards the same common goal. We just need to have strength in numbers. We need to work together to, to continue to push and, and, and make things better. The, um, yeah. there's, one, there's, a, there's another one here on this list that uh, I, I feel mm -hmm. that, it, that is very important. And it's something that we touch on quite often on the Reefer Reporters. Because we report on, uh, you know, in the state, on stuff that's coming out of the U.S. And we see so many new laws coming in where they are literally writing away dismissing removing possession charges off of people uh, um oh, their history and, and i see on here that yes uh that you want to deal with cannabis amnesty uh for cannabis charges and canada's record is just brutal yeah i i was a lucky recipient of a pardon for for simple possession because i was lucky enough to have a charge that fell within that narrow scope, um, but everybody should be pardoned. We are, this is, this is absurd. This is like when they legalized being gay and people still had like <laughs> criminal charges for being gay on their record. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's limiting. It's very limiting. And it's, it's, it's continuing to stigmatize people and criminalize cannabis use, even post legalization, because if somebody has a job application where they need to, you know, and then some stupid old charge comes up from like, even if it was, even if it was a trafficking charge, even if it was, you know, as long as it was a nonviolent cannabis only charge, it should a hundred percent. Well, I think all drugs, but because we're talking about cannabis should be a hundred percent expunged from, from the records. It's, it's, it's more than just simple possession. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. very rarely yeah. done. It needs to be like everything. It needs to be if you were caught growing yeah. fields of cannabis, you need to be pardoned so that you can move on with your life and maybe even work for one of these companies. Maybe even get a security clearance so that you can actually grow for grow legally. We need to incorporate and bring people in. And the first way that we can do that is by reconciling these sort of ridiculous charges. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah, exactly. opened up the doors for us to apply for a pardon for these things. The hoops that you've got to jump through to get to the point where you're actually doing this. I read a story on this not too long ago. It was, it was under like 200 people or something that have actually been pardoned since they implemented this a few years ago. Yeah, like we were, me and my partner were like number 70 and 71 or something like that. Like it was re like we were really... Low. Yeah. Uh, 
it's, 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 it wasn't a big deal to get pardoned, but it's just a narrow scope of who qualifies, right? Like, that's the real issue. Yeah. More, you need to go and you need to get a criminal background check. That costs 75 bucks. So the pardon itself is free, but the stuff you have to do to get yeah. the pardon is not free. That's the barrier that they don't tell you. That's but, right. It does correct. cost you money. Yeah, so it costs yeah. you money. If you don't have the money to pay for all of these things, you're not getting it. Fingerprints, but, all that stuff. The actual paper paperwork itself and like filing for the pardon is a pretty simple form. Like start to finish, like the day that I I got it to the day that I was actually fully pardoned was like less than two months. So wow. it, it also really it was it was easier to get a pardon for a simple possession charge than it was to renew my license for cannabis, like for my growing license for sure. Wow, hands down. Things so have believe changed. that. Things have, <laughs> but it still things have changed. Things have changed. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it still costs you some money. But, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. But it was a yeah. narrow, yeah. like, it's only physical possession. So that needs to be broadened so that everybody can. And it also, I mean, you have these groups like Cannabis Amnesty, um, who I think are backed by an LP. It's either Aurora or Hexo, one of them anyways. But like, it's that rich. <laughs> like, like from, <laughs> from them, like, just completely co-opting something. But, like, all they need to do is to be lobbying for for these simple changes like that's like it's in the past of course anybody who is currently being imprisoned for cannabis also needs to be released like released, there should yeah. be no prison for pot <laughs> so of course no prison for pot we've been exactly. chatting that for 20 years no prison for pot yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, Genaway, we could probably go on for another hour. Um, oh, we're gonna a... have to have you back and get more updates on um where normal is going in the future, what actions you guys are gonna be taking uh to affect some change at the federal and the provincial level for the people that are in this country that are in love with this plant, uh, both on the medicinal and the recreational side, legal, and we even even touched on legacy markets. So we're going to have to have you oh. back. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I love oh, it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And just so you know, we got, I got some more comments for you. All right. Que- a question. Yeah. Okay, here in Ontario, we don't run into this problem, but there are some provinces that have a mixed cannabis and liquor uh, business. Uh, the question from Ron is, now I don't know how those businesses are set up, but if they are together, like, you know, what do they do when, the, this question came up when you were talking about children coming into the stores. You know, how you're allowed to take children into the LCBO, but you can't take them into right. a, a into a cannabis store. Oh, good question. What would you Never do in a that. province where those two are combined in the same establishment? Nova Scotia. Okay, so yeah, Nova, Nova Scotia. Scotia. That's interesting. I mean, are are you, I mean, Is ultimately it? they should just cloud in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. They, Exactly. You're allowed in one, but not the other. But it's the same store. So uh, now what? <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone, in, yeah. in my opinion. But Nova Scotia um, and the public sale model, I, I would, I don't know if that's going to last very long. Like I know New Brunswick is um, getting out of it because it's just been a total waste of money, and it should have been private sale the whole time. So um, I, I. I don't think Nova Scotia is doing too well with cannabis distribution at all. So as you would expect, it's not their area of expertise. You can't like, it's just ridiculous. So yeah, if anything, I, I would like to see those provinces move towards private sale anyway. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he has a, he has a comment. Yeah, we're yeah. Talking, but I would we're imagine talking... they're allowed in. There, there couldn't be a, there couldn't be a restriction because they're allowed into one. They're allowed into both. I think the one that allows it would override the one that doesn't. If they're using yeah. the same space. Right. Now, yeah, Ron, absolutely. I would think. Ron lives in Northern Ontario. Good question, Ontario. Oh, Ron. He li- Ron lives in Northern Ontario. He says, he says, between him and North Bay, there is a community that has banned public smoking or public cannabis smoking. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's an example where, you know, where lounges obviously would be a big benefit because you can't consume yeah. it in the public. So, so what if I went shopping it- there? 
and I had to medicate. I mean, you know, the, as long as there's like a sustainable way for a consumption lounge to be able to do business, like I say, yeah. they need to be able to sell cannabis. Yeah. Then yes, especially in a small community like Northern Ontario, like they need they need to be able to pay the bills still, and they're not going to be able to do that with just chocolate bars and bong mm. rentals. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, I agree. Totally. There needs to be that's why we need consumption lounges, but they they need to be set up for success. It, it can't just be a half measure like decriminalization, for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I got one more comment from Ron, and I do have a question. I want an opinion from you on something. I know we're running long here, but. Um, Ron, Ron says, sounds like you're the perfect person for your possession with normal. Thank you for being a voice for the change that needs to happen. Oh, Ron, that's so <laughs> hey, There you go. Feel yeah. like back up week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and where I was going to ask about the opinion on something, it just came to my head. Um, there was something in the news recently about a cannabis store uh, in Windsor area opening a, uh, a lounge. Yes. Yeah, there was. Um, there's, and I guess the counselors there are losing their minds about it and trying to prevent it from happening. And it's just a terrible case yeah. in India. It's just really embarrassing. Like, they need to stay out of business. If the streets are completely free of potholes and, you know, nobody's speeding and everything's working fine in the city, then maybe they can start, you know, getting critical yeah. about hardworking business owners. Like, it's ridiculous. Let people run their business. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Train. Train. Yeah, as soon as the announcement came out, it was all like all happy and everything. There was going to be a lounge, and then council's like, "What? There's going to be a what? No, 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 no." And uh, yeah, yeah, the crap hit the fan, so to speak, right? Yeah. And they're uh, they're trying to put the kibosh on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really, it's really like well, um, yeah. really backwards. You know, if they can sell alcohol in a bar, there's no reason why they can't sell pre rolls and buds at a lounge. And beverages and edibles. So, that's right. All right, um, Kim, have you got any more questions? You want to throw a general? I got uh, a gazillion towards... questions. I know. I got. I know. I know. Long, I'm going to call it, and we're going to have her back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, uh, Genoway. This is the time for the shout out. A person, place, a thing, a website. Uh, let people know where you can find you. Whatever, all that type of stuff. Um, well, if you want, you can follow me. It's just at Genaway, um, J-E-N-N-A-W-A-E. Um, that's because I have such a unique name. I've, I'm able to <laughs> get pretty easy handles. So that's just my Twitter handle, and I am very active on Twitter. Um, but if you are in Kingston and you want to buy weed, um, please stop by one of my stores. It's Calix and Tricombs, and calixandtricombs.com is our is our website. Um, we have our prices beat the OCS, so we have pretty good pretty good prices. Um, but otherwise, uh, check out normalcanada.org. We will be updating our website by the end of the month. We're hoping to have some interesting content from Lyft there, and uh, we'll be laying out all of our plans in, in a lot more detail uh, on the website so that we can sort of grade things province by province, stakeholder by stakeholder. And we just want to make sure everybody is like heard and um, really involved. So please reach out to me at any point and we can definitely make sure that whatever your concern is, that it's, it's, it's considered. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Kim? Oh, uh, uh, shout out. Um, I, I'm going to give a shout out to Corey Yellen. Uh, Corey Yellen out in the West Coast, great lady helping lots of patients. If you have issues with cancer or anything uh, that you think cannabis oil can help and you want more information, reach out to Corey Yellen. 
She's a great lady and doing great things out on the West Coast. Her and her protege, her partner, uh, Ian, do a, a radio show uh, podcast, and I was honored to be part of that today. That will be, be aired next week on Corey's channel. So check out Corey Ellen. All right, good stuff. Good to know. Check out that. Uh, and uh, just to let everybody know, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Reefer Reporters, 10 o'clock, uh, is cancelled uh, tomorrow morning um, that is due to Remembrance Day tomorrow because um, the that is actually the Reef Reporters broadcast goes on during that time so uh, I was in discussion with Cindy and tomorrow uh, there is no Reef Reporter broadcast on the network and it will return yeah. Monday we will return Monday morning with uh, Kelly and myself yeah, All right. absolutely makes sense. My moment of silence at 11 a.m. So 11 a.m. We don't want to be on the air. That's right. Yep. So there's no reefer reporters tomorrow, in, in uh, for in honor of Remembrance Day. So. All righty. Uh, thank you. Go, thank you. Just go to our sponsors, uh, friendly folks at Legacy420.com, BMAHydroponics.com, Kellenford Lifestyle Shop, as uh, as well as uh, well Legacy420.com. Uh, let's see. Big thank you to our guest, Genway McLean of Executive Director of Normal Canada and the owner of Calyx and Tricones. Thank you very much for Genway for coming on the program. Uh, as Kim said, we got to have you back. There's much more we have to discuss. Oh, okay. Thank you. I would love to. It's awesome. All righty. Uh, Kim, as always, thank you. Working a little overtime. And back at you. Uh, (laughs) thank you to the listeners and good night talk to you soon good night The opinions of the individuals during this broadcast are their own and may not be the opinions of their group or other organizations they may be involved with. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. Do you want to hear what patients and cannabis advocates have to say? If so, then catch the Pace Radio Show Wednesday nights here on paceradio.net. We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net.